Good evening and welcome to Boston University's Real Estate Club Guest Speaker Series for conversations about real estate leadership management and people who have achieved something in our society. Maury Tognorelli is certainly that. He's the CEO of Heitman, one of the world's largest real estate investment firms with currently $46 billion in assets under management and 10 offices around the globe. Uh, Maury, good to have you here. Thanks for having uh, me. It's really a uh, pleasure to be here. Let's start at the beginning. Uh, how did you know you wanted to pursue a career in real estate when you made the decision to pursue a bachelor's in real estate from Indiana's University Kelly School of Business? Well, um, at the time that I was in university, uh, the initial years were basically the foundation of education. And I was going through the basic uh, coursework. And uh, I happened to have an opportunity to uh, take a summer internship at Heitman. And it was the intersect of the experience I had over the summer in applying the statistics and the economics and the financial analysis that I had learned in my studies and was able to apply it to an asset class like property. And property was just emerging at that point in time the investment management industry that uh, today is well understood uh, was really just a, an evolving industry at, at that point in time. So the intersect was uh, good timing and it uh, captured my, uh, my interest and um, I've never looked back. Uh, you started your career as an analyst uh, with Heitman and then worked your way up to becoming CEO presently. Uh, can you tell me a bit, a little bit about the evolution of Heitman since joining the firm and your experiences in climbing the corporate ladder? Yeah. So w one of the questions that I'm often asked is, uh, you've spent your entire career at one firm, um, and um, what, what's what's that been like? And for me, at least, my, my role has been in constant change since uh, I began as an analyst learning uh, the basic fundamentals of model creation, assessing risk, uh, interpreting both quantitative and qualitative factors that uh, would be supportive or not of making an investment. And also um, learning uh, the very important complementary set of skills, which is to work alongside others and uh, to collaborate and to work to achieve some type of common outcome. And so Heitman, as, as uh, the real estate investment management industry was evolving, Heitman was a firm that was viewed um, as one of the emerging firms. Uh, we were a fully vertically integrated organization, uh, which means uh, we not only provided investment uh, management uh, services to our clients, uh, but we also had, uh, as part of our organizational structure, property management and leasing, uh, reporting and administration, and a number of other real estate related disciplines that allowed us to make investments on behalf of our clients at that point in time of, uh, of the firm's evolution. Uh, the firm was uh, roughly 40 individuals when I joined. And it quickly grew over eight to nine years to 900. Uh, by the early 1990s, uh, it had uh, gone through a initial uh, operating company level transaction where uh, the majority of the equity in the firm was acquired by a listed uh, firm on the New York Stock Exchange called United Asset Management. Their strategy was to make investments in boutique investment managers and help them grow their businesses. And that they did. The next year, they helped us acquire a competitive firm in Chicago. And we quickly went from 900 to 2,300 employees and I think circa 13 billion in assets under management. Uh, and uh, that's of the organizational frame for most of the 90s uh, until later in that period, uh, we had reached a point where uh, we needed uh, to make a number of changes, a number of changes that would allow for both 
the shareholders that uh, were um, uh, part of the New York Stock Exchange listed group and some of the founding members to reconstitute that ownership, uh, to change the governance, to re-equitize the firm, and really to position it to grow into the next century. And the industry was quickly uh, emerging at that point in time, the listed markets were evolving for property, uh, as was the opportunity fund uh, business that was spawned by uh, one of the market corrections in the early 90s. And Heitman was positioned all in the center of that. And really it was a great opportunity for both uh, taking the organization forward and creating the organization that exists today, uh, as well as to uh, uh, be able to uh, take on a new set of responsibilities, a new set of challenges uh, that uh, were beyond just simply the investment side of the operations of our business. It was the people side, which is the critical resource that really is our difference. It, is the ingredient that ultimately finds its way into outcomes. Uh, and there are many reasons for it. And I found that to be a very compelling set of opportunities. And so from a North American only focused investment management firm making direct investments in property, we grew the organization uh, organically to a global organization with a, a competencies in three uh, interconnected disciplines within the real estate or property capital markets. Uh, that is, we make investments directly into property via private equity. We make investments in property by sourcing and originating financing uh, on behalf of sponsors or owners of properties that allow us to position our capital in the debt capitalization structure of an asset and achieve a different risk uh, return profile, but none the same complementary to making direct investments in the equity of property. And then last, we manage uh, portfolios of uh, listed securities that we pull together in order to uh, achieve some uh, desired outcome of risk and reward. And we do that uh, over, uh, as you said, uh, a series of offices spread across the globe, uh, but headquartered in Hong Kong, London, and, and Chicago at present. Thank you. And how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected the various asset types, such as retail or office, more specifically, your current portfolio? Yeah, um, retail and office as sectors are perhaps the two, other than hospitality, that um, uh, from the onstart of the virus uh, received the most focus and had the most headlines. Uh, there were many predictions of their demise at that point in time. Um, we, we felt as though it was premature to reach any of those conclusions from what we could observe both here in the United States and abroad. Um, we thought like every crisis, there were opportunities uh, that um, presented themselves where the market was misunderstanding the risks of certain issues. And as a result, uh, we would have an advantage. And so office um, uh, retail and hospitality to a much lesser extent, all were challenged by different factors uh, at different points in time. And then as the public health conditions began their recovery and improvement, um, we started to observe data coming out of the properties that reinforced that thesis, that, that belief that um, you can't take a broad brush and apply it to all circumstances. And so we started to see a differentiation in the way properties were behaving, uh, retail properties, specifically the higher quality centers were consolidating their market share. They were continuing to track tenancy. Their retail performance, um, uh, the retail sales performance was uh, often uh, uh, very similar, if not above uh, within a short period of time, pre-COVID activity. 
and we could see the foundation for the recovery in that sector. Office, of course, in part will be dependent upon the return to work, which is underway and is growing. Um, it's quite different here in North America than it is in London and Europe and in Asia. And um, our view is that uh, in general, as public health conditions improve, we can't predict exactly uh, whether office populations will return to 100% pre-COVID levels or not. But we think that that distinction won't be that significant because in the end, offices will continue to be a place for collaboration, development, and that, that spontaneous combustion that comes from uh, intelligent individuals being together, uh, working collectively on an issue. And you need to do that from uh, center locations. And we think uh, they may look different. They may be finished in a different way. Uh, tenancies may use their space in a much more provocative uh, uh, approach to achieving those three objectives, but they'll be in offices. And so our view is uh, that um, um, those certain assets uh, will suffer and certainly they always do. Uh, that won't be the, uh, the consequences for the entire sector itself. Um, and I think uh, the, the remainder of your question really was about how, how did those two particular sectors uh, contrast to our portfolio and our approach uh, at that point in time. And uh, our weightings have been uh, fairly consistent, our sector weightings have been fairly consistent for some time now, for several years. Uh, we had been in a defensive position uh, or, or orientation, uh, anticipating some end to an expansion cycle that had exceeded all expansion cycles uh, that had preceded it. And so we were really in an environment where we knew that there might be change. We had no idea that the virus would be the mechanism for creating that change. But we had a view that if there was change, we wanted to be underway to office in general. We wanted to have a, uh, a neutral way uh, to retail and we wanted to have the assets that were in our portfolio to primarily have the attributes that I cited that we believed would allow them to weather any kind of change in environment. And that largely uh, what is what has transpired. Other sectors that performed very well during the crisis included multifamily residential, uh, industrial um, specialty like self-storage uh, and medical office. Uh, and um, some of the more specialty asset types like data centers, uh, et cetera. The CEO of uh, Brookfield Asset Management, Bruce Flatt, uh, I think you may know where I'm going with this one, but. He recently said now is a good time to start liquidating assets. Uh, do you agree with that or how do you feel about that statement? Well, I, again, I didn't hear the entirety of his comments, but I can imagine knowing Bruce that what he was trying to articulate is that for investors who have assets in their portfolios that have had their business plans executed and that it was uh, entering a phase where monetizing their value creation uh, strategy is appropriate, that those types of situations would be uh, intersecting with a market that was quite favorable and therefore would, would reward the capital for the risk it took. And I agree with that. I, I agree that in those situations, that's the case. I, I would uh, not be able to comment without hearing that context but um, it shouldn't, I think, be interpreted as his view that uh, uh, investors in property should be exiting from their positions because I, I don't think that that's, uh, from what I know, that's not what his intent would have been. Well said, thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's shift focus a little bit and I wanna congratulate you on the recent closing this year of $3.2 billion for three different funds, three new funds. That's really exciting news. Yeah. Uh, what, is your, what is your thesis for these three funds over its three-year uh, horizon? 
Yeah, so they're each a little bit different. Um, we were uh, pre-COVID uh, embarking on a product cycle launch period that was ambitious. We had a number of different strategies. When COVID uh, raised its head, we realized that um, some of the opportunities, the strategies, the risks that were present in the market might warrant changing the order of some of the executions. And so that caused us to uh, um, uh, begin to market uh, for capital, our North American value fund, uh, which we call Heitman Value Partners. Uh, we were marketing the fifth fund in the series. And um, so the performance in its preceding um, uh, fund series had been quite positive. This is a strategy that is looking to invest in assets where there's some type of mispricing, some type of inefficiency, some way to use capital to employ it uh, in a way that generates uh, returns that are uh, above uh, average for the risk using leverage as part of the capitalization. And so the way to think about it is um, there's a lower end risk and return strategies often defined as core. There's middle of the risk return continuum that's often separated between core plus and then value add strategies. They're all in this range of uh, utilizing leverage as part of the capitalization and some type of transitional value creation strategy in order to achieve higher returns. And then there's uh, the high yield opportunity type investment strategies, which use higher leverage, often are transitioning properties through much more significant capital or repositioning strategies. Uh, there may be some type of operating company strategy, and those are designed to achieve high returns, but there is higher risk associated with those strategies. And um, uh, in Heitman Value Partners uh, a situation, the first of the funds uh, of the three, it is a value add North American strategy. Uh, the second uh, of the three uh, was called, or is called Heitman Debt Partners Two high yield debt fund or credit financing fund uh, that was uh, launched in order to meet the expected demand from owners of property that were seeking not to sell equity, but to bring in a fixed cost of capital. There was some type of uh, transitional value creation strategy that was associated with the opportunity. And uh, in our view, we would be paid an attractive return for the period of time that we provided the capital, uh, but it was uh, oriented towards financing as opposed to equity. And then the final strategy is a new strategy in its entirety. Uh, it's called uh, 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 Heitman uh, Global Real Estate Fund Two, And it's our view that over time, investors seeking uh, to build portfolios of property to achieve some stated outcome, we'll need to do so with a global orientation. And we think that that coincides well with where the world is at geopolitically, as well as from a macro uh, economic uh, perspective, uh, global trade, the economies of the world are delinking and becoming less correlated. And in our view, uh, property investors that historically have achieved their exposure through some type of regional strategy. So Europe only, Middle East only, North America only, uh, or Asia only, Asia Pac only, um, will find it more challenging to do so because those portfolios will experience higher volatility as their independence within the global macroeconomic frame create those trade changes in economic cycles. Uh, and as a result, uh, they'll be rewarded for exposure in other parts of the world, which will counter some of the volatility over time. And that strategy is a core plus strategy. So it'll use less leverage and is designed to achieve returns uh, that are lower than a value strategy, 
but I think are in the uh, target zone for what uh, investors in property should achieve for taking positions in global property markets, such as the major cities of the world, um, London, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Sydney, um, Berlin, um, Paris, New York, et cetera. You mentioned London just uh, just now. Yeah. Heidman manages more than $5 billion of self-storage across the globe. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us about the self-storage sector for a little bit and including Heitman's current thesis and the space station platform uh, based in the UK? Yeah, so that, that's a recent investment. Uh, we made an investment in an organization that had some assets, but it had an operating team. Um, we knew that we could uh, import or uh, depending on your frame of mind, export our experience and knowledge of that sector uh, into that organization. And we could help scale the business through the use of capital to allow the team to be uh, further rounded out and then also to be able to use capital to employ, to buy new property uh, and add to the portfolio and therefore create uh, value or higher returns through a number of different approaches. One is simply allowing scale to drive down your costs and spread your cost of operations over a wider portfolio and benefit from that. The other is, of course, as you build a portfolio of size, there are very few in Europe and in Asia in, in this particular sector. And so presumably uh, you're acquiring assets at a return, which uh, when combined with other assets in a broader portfolio, uh, will achieve a more premium pricing. So you capture cap rate compression or growth through assemblage, which is another proven strategy uh, that we've been able to um, execute uh, over time. And self-storage lends itself um, to uh, exposure in a portfolio. It's, it's a, a wonderful sector. Uh, the supply demand fundamentals are visible uh, and um, it is a sector that uh, is probably, uh, if, if you were to relate it to where the sector was uh, in North America at a similar point in time, Europe and, and the United Kingdom may be five to 10 years behind the United States in the evolution of self-storage. Um, Asia may be even a little bit further, depending on the specific location. But these are emerging sectors. And what's very attractive is in self-storage, the nature of the improvements require very little capital in order to be reinvested by ownership. And so it, uh, it operates at a very high margin in general because you provide very few services to storage users. And as a result, a large share of the revenue that you achieve for renting the space is something that's distributed to ownership consistently over time. They're short duration lease terms. And so effectively that's a, uh, uh, an alignment with what the uh, central bank policy and interest rate policies have been now for 10 years. And so we very much have the ability to use that in our portfolios to make sure we capture quickly uh, quarter over quarter or year over year changes in growth and drive that into the returns uh, on a very attractive basis without having the need to invest a lot of capital in the assets themselves. So it particularly is attractive to generating portfolio outcomes and that's, that's how we view the sector and its role within portfolio construction. Heitman also recently acquired an office building in London's West End in a joint yeah. venture with Greycoat. Uh, can yeah. you tell us a little bit about your business plan here and your outlook on the UK market? Well, this, this asset is positioned quite attractively in uh, the Mayfair area, and it is um, um, a... Um, an asset that <clears throat> um, is more boutique-ish 
it requires capital to be invested in for retentioning, uh, but it also is an asset that because of its positioning offers uh, users in the market uh, the potential for some unique amenities, including um, our plans to add a rooftop garden, as well as some other features that the outside elevations of the property allow for, but that will offer really interesting uh, boutique-like uh, office space for the users in, in, in the area. So we thought we were entering our position early in the recovery cycle. Uh, the pricing was attractive. Uh, we saw an opportunity to use our capital to make improvements that we thought would be rewarded through higher rents and also uh, leasing. And um, we're excited to begin, begin the execution of that strategy. Now let's shift focus a little bit away from Heitman and its current investment focus and activity. Uh, do you see a radically different future in investing, developing, and managing real assets? Uh, do so. The so I'm not sure specifically what you're referring to if if your question is really will the industry continue to evolve uh in its its quest i'll say to refine or perfect investing in property i think the answer is yes i think the industry is and has proven to be very adept at looking at uh each cycle understanding the behaviors of the assets and what caused them to either deliver outcomes that were expected or not, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and carry that forward in approaches to trying to uh, be responsible for our clients' portfolios and, and meeting or exceeding expectations. So I, I think like every cycle, there are lessons we can learn in, in this particular one we were faced by something that people have often referred to as unprecedented uh, it then was followed by um, periods of uh, social unrest the geopolitical environment was um, also uh, presenting uh, factors into urban locations that were impacting the experiences of residents and, and property owners. And so uh, we were able to see that these, these assets uh, that um, uh, had uh, never before been confronted by uh, a change that was so sudden, uh, for example, Heitman, when um, we came to the decision to work remotely, which was right around the middle of March. Uh, in a matter of two days, we transitioned from a workforce that was embedded within 10 office locations around the globe to one that was completely remote. And um, all the planning and policies and procedures and investments that went into business continuity, developing the systems, testing them, uh, being prepared, not just for our responsibilities to continue to operate, but for the assets themselves to continue to serve in that role for the tenants that needed occupancy and to utilize them. That was the real experience that I think uh, is a testament to how far the industry has evolved. And I think PropTech has some contribution to that, the ability to monitor systems, to make changes remotely, um, the ability to uh, allow users of assets such as residences that want to rent apartments to be able to visit those properties, not in person, but virtually to be able to make a decision as to how they wanted to relocate during a time of crisis. All of those elements were opportunities that had not been experienced before. And the industry, the people within it uh, uh, really rallied, I think and showed well uh, for the investors in the space. And um, that, that's what's most important in my view. What professional achievements are you most proud of or which mark you the most? And what are some of the greatest takeaways, learning experiences from those, from those uh, achievements? Well, I, so you're talking to someone that 
looks at the achievements as simply the byproduct of doing something well. And as I've said, um, that uh, there, there's a saying, something along the lines of, if you love what you do, you don't work a day in your life. And so uh, the, the byproduct and the acknowledgements and so forth um, are all elements of uh, doing more, making more right decisions than wrong decisions. The attributes that I think are the, the, the real uh, benefits or the, the things to learn from, to take away, to focus, the guidance, so to speak, would be one, listen. Listening is a lost art for many. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for it and uh, it's invaluable. Uh, often <coughs> through impatience, people tend to not hear exactly what the individual they're speaking to is saying, and that's a missed opportunity and, and has so many other um, implications. Second, <clears throat> the art of communicating, both in writing and verbally. They are arts that uh, have a significant impact on how you gain influence in any matter, let alone property. And I think these are attributes that some value, some do not. Uh, it's been incredibly impactful in my career. And um, I think if I could part with uh, that piece of advice uh, and uh, it had impact, then that would be a you know, great accomplishment. Uh, in addition to that, um, I think that the investment management business is always a business of trust. Uh, frankly, anytime that there is some type of exchange between parties and it's economic, there is that need for there to be that, that clarity, that integrity that goes along with being um, instilled with the responsibility of investing on behalf of others. Uh, when I think about our, our role and responsibility, the majority of our clients are retirement benefit plans from across the globe. And so our simple but very complex job is to use that money appropriately to place in investments so that some way we're contributing to someone's retirement uh, that they work so hard for. And that's the way in which I, I try and inspire our team to uh, focus on the bigger picture and to um, see the impact we're having. China Evergrande now has missed its third round of bond payments in three weeks, intensifying market fears over contagion involving other property developers. What's your perspective on the situation? And does Heitman have exposure here? Uh, so we do not have exposure, number one. Um, and we're not invested in mainland China. Uh, I think the world uh, and um, the uh, property industry itself is obviously um, curious and in some cases concerned about uh, the implications of something so significant and whether there's contagion. I think it's hard to say that there's, uh, it's a contagion free zone for all of our operations in the Asia Pacific region. But if, if there is exposure, it would be through its impact to the Hong Kong economy or investors in the mainland <clears throat> and how they invest their capital in, in parts of the region. Uh, but fortunately, uh, we, we, we don't have any interactions with Evergrande, so. Great, and finally, uh, what was the best piece of advice you've ever received? And what advice would you give the younger version of yourself if you could go back in time? So um, the best piece of advice I received was that if I had the ability to work abroad globally, I should jump at the opportunity. And um, my, my, my travels later in my career confirmed that. There is a need for <clears throat> more and more professionally professionally skilled individuals in the property industry 
that have a global understanding of uh, the property markets of the world, the investors of the world, can relate it to the cultural differences uh, as you move across the globe and use that as an asset uh, to add value to the demands that investors will seek from their investment managers going forward. We're just at the beginning of the global evolution and um, the more resources that have that competency, the better. And so for young professionals, the opportunity to serve a year or two in, in Europe, in the United Kingdom, uh, in Tokyo or in Hong Kong or in Singapore, uh, th those are experiences that should be uh, jumped at in order to uh, create a, a foundation for a career in property investment management that will be well served. Maury, thank you so much for your time here tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure. We all learned a lot and just thank you, truly. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. And uh, uh, of course, uh, I hope you and your family are and continue to be well in this environment. Thank you.